I've dedicated my life to pursuing the impossible. And what I've learned through the adventures that I've gone on is that the impossible is often just a mindset. There is an ocean between saying and doing. And for most people, that ocean never gets smaller. I'm the first person to have circumnavigated the entire African continent by bicycle, a journey that took two years, two months, and 15 days. I've kayaked around Madagascar and Iceland. I've rode across the Atlantic and Pacific Oceans. These were my adventures. Now, I want to share my knowledge with the world. Every week, I'll be inviting a new guest to join me so that I can prove that adventure is everywhere and is waiting for you. I'm Rian Mansa, and welcome to How to Adventure. The Middle East is a region known for its mountains, deserts, and holy places. It's dry and arid and incredibly hot in the summer, with long days going into warm nights. My day began in a Bedouin campsite, outside the city and in the middle of a mountainous desert. What's going to be a new experience for me is what I've decided to do on my off day. I've had an invite from a guy who knows about kayaking on the Dead Sea. It is definitely going to be a new world. The Dead Sea is an hour's drive up from here. For this adventure, I wanted to flip the notion of Israel as a desert destination on its head and go and explore on and in the water that rings the country on its western and southern borders. So, I mean, I consider myself experienced having paddled in the Indian Ocean, the Pacific Ocean, the Atlantic Ocean, and now, in one of the strangest seas on the planet, the Dead Sea. After a brief drive, my first destination was the world-renowned Dead Sea. I've kayaked many of the planet's waters, and this unique body of water was going to be unlike any other I had been on. Thanks, Marit. Yes, this is what you would consider desolate. Getting up early and getting out here is going to be worth it. The area of the Dead Sea that we found ourselves in was far from the tourist idea of a hotel and spa. With nothing around for kilometers, we really had the entire sea to ourselves. The first thing that grabs me is just this glare. It is super bright. I'm not really one for sunglasses, but I can see this is a day when I needed one. Also, this is the lowest point on the planet. On Earth, 430 meters below sea level. That's extraordinary. My guest for the day was one of the few people in the world who had kayaked the Dead Sea regularly. Oh, fair, how's it? My Hi. name's Rian. Hello. Are you okay? Thank yeah. you. Good to meet you. My name is Ofer Shmuelfeld. I have a business, uh, it's called Kayak Tours Israel. I'm a kayaker maybe not 20 years, but uh, 70 years, something like this. I told you about this kayak, this boat, yes? Yeah. They came from Wales. They are the best kayak of all the world. Mm. It's really, we say if you want to go to travel in some place, if you want to back, just do it with this kayak. <laughs> it's correct. And it's fiberglass. And these it's fibers. fiberglass, okay. yes. And it's a handicraft. They don't do nothing with machine, of course. Okay, and then I see, are we taking any um, water supplies with us on yes, the deck? But, but because, I don't like to put the, the water there because it's uh, it's not good when you feather. Top heavy. Yes. And we put it here. And we have this. If we want something energy, you need to try it. <laughs> Thank you. 
I didn't have breakfast this morning, so thank you. This okay, is going to do me so good. The route you've got planned for me today is to go where? We go to the north of this area, uh, but we, we start in, in this close. This is a sinkhole. Wow, the sinkhole. In the sinkhole. We can uh, found there a sold uh, diamond, that, like, nice. like you see this here. Wow, okay. Sold diamond. This is a uh, 100% sold. Uh, wow. Water. We can't clean it with uh, fresh water because it's gone. Yes. We need to put to clean it in the Dead Sea water. Is this 100% natural? Yes. The Dead Sea is known for being one of the saltiest bodies of water on planet Earth. Rain and surface water flows in, has nowhere to flow to, and it evaporates, leaving behind minerals and salt that become more and more concentrated. I think that's an interesting thing. This one piece will make 52 layers. Watch on mobile devices or the big screen. All for free. No subscription required. A lot of people from Israel, when they come to the Dead Sea, they want uh, to swim a little bit, and they put something on the uh, dirt, on the body, and that's it. But they don't been, been in the Dead Sea with kayak. When you go with kayak, you can see things that you can't see them without kayak. Boats and kayaks are not permitted on the Dead Sea. Luckily for me, Ofer had wrangled the right permits and the government and military allowed him free reign of the waters, within reason, of course. The first thing that I realized was the water is thicker. It's like oil. It is like oil. Wow. Okay. What is that smell that we are smelling now? The smell it because we are yes. now near the sinkhole. We have there a lot of mineral, and <clears throat> because the mineral is have a stink, you know. Sure. Stroking an oar through the water is like nothing I've experienced before. The turquoise green water has an oily, slick, heavy quality to it. The Dead Sea is surprisingly calm. No tides, no waves, and the only current you really experience is generated by the wind. Thanks to constant movement of spring water around the sea's perimeter, natural sinkholes appear, forcing the ground to shift and move, allowing a direct injection of fresh water into the salt-heavy sea. Fair, so it is these layers of white, the salt yeah. that gets eaten by the fresh water. Yes. And then that causes the collapse. Yes. If you, if you put it now in the water, it's gone. It will get eaten. Yes. The sinkholes in the area are also testament to the fading of the Dead Sea. With the lowering water levels, the ground gives away and the ever-occurring sinkholes force more soil and sediment into the water, eroding the foundations along the coast. Nearer to the shoreline from where we were paddling were natural bodies of salt that were slowly developing upwards over time. No way! Creating many islands in the Dead Sea. The salt is solid and can be walked on, really giving you the appearance of walking on water. So this is a site of what creates a sinkhole because of this fresh water that is continually coming through here. You feel that it's like a fresh water? It's, it's different. These holes over here, you can see where it comes out. You see the fresh water pouring out here. What fascinated me were the steps that ringed the shoreline and almost looked man-made, but the truth about the strange shoreline formations were a lot more sobering. This is what you mentioned to me earlier, yes. that every year, the lowering yeah. of the Dead Sea. Yes. It's, it's That's a... last year, the year before, the year yes. before. Yes. Oh, fair. That is shocking if you think about it. The Dead Sea will not be here for much longer. Since Israel's inception as a country in 1948, the Dead Sea has already lost one third of its volume of water. And experts argue that if the decline is not stopped, the Dead Sea will be completely dry by the year 2050. The constant chemical reaction that is taking place in the Dead Sea results in the formation of striking salt crystal formations. Stalactites form along the banks of the sea, gathering salt particles and growing continuously. What I notice about these is how the water droplets, like you would see in a cave in South Africa, yes, of course. still come through and yeah. create that point. Whoa, yeah. It's good. It is the opposite <laughs> of good. 
The area we had rounded had miraculously formed a cave-like crystalline structure, solid as rock and able to be walked on. These formations are natural works of art. You wouldn't believe this is just salt. It can't be just salt. I can imagine just spending a lazy Sunday afternoon with some hummus and falafels, seeing the world and Jordan in the distance. The sheer scale and variety of the salt structures can boggle the mind, and I couldn't believe what I was seeing along the shore. Now I want to sit like the king in that chair. It's one day you ah, are the king of the Dead Sea. Something very similar. You want to eat something? Um, <laughs> I'm not hungry right now, ah. thank you, but you can bring me a glass of wine. Okay, I go to the car and I bring you. <laughs> The different chemical compounds react differently and crystallize, creating a diverse array of natural formations. They're stunning to look at and completely unique to just this area of the world. Pockets of water that feed the Dead Sea from underneath the water table stream upwards to the surface. With fresh water being lighter than the saline-rich seawater, the fresh water rises to the top and creates what looks like chimneys jutting up from the sea's floor. This is just too special. Here's one below us. Here's another one. Wow, wow. Yes, Sophia, they, this is incredible. And that is May the water, fresh water coming out. Yes. I was just seeing what the top of these chimneys look like from the surface, but they are in fact massive underwater formations of salt crystals that will continue to grow and grow. So this originally was one of those chimneys? Yes. Before one year, it's in the water. Well, Fair, I never thought coming to Israel that I'd get the chance to experience the Dead Sea like this. Most people look out of their hotel room and they look at yes. the Dead Sea and they think that they've understood it. Oh. You have to really get your hands salty and, and wet and you have to actually touch what the Dead Sea is about because it's not as dead as people think it is. It's not dead. Paddling on one of the world's most remarkable bodies of water was an adventure unlike any other. I really felt like I had ticked something amazing off my bucket list. Oh, fair to be this close has really opened my eyes, but we've paddled a long distance, and if that sun is going to set behind that mountain soon, we yeah. better be heading back. Okay. I'll race you back. Not many enjoy the privilege of exploring this World Heritage Site by kayak, and many in the future might not be able to unless the sea is safeguarded for future generations. I must tell you, probably one of my paddling highlights of my life. Okay, you, you can see that it's not a dead sea, it's a life sea. It is a life sea, yeah. My sincere hope was to return here one day to a replenished sea and paddle out again into the sunset. Heading 200 kilometers straight down to southern Israel saw me land in the bustling city of Eilat and towards the warm currents of the Red Sea. I was back in the water just for something entirely different. From the Dead Sea to the Red Sea in Israel, diving with dolphins is something that I've never done. Our guest today is a young Israeli, been to the military, but I'm sure in the military, they don't do diving with dolphins. So I think for her, it's also going to be a new experience. Eilat is one of Israel's newer cities, one trying its best to establish itself as a tourist hub and a destination city for beach goers and lovers of the ocean. It's a tax-free city, developed to encourage more traffic to its sunny shores. So my diving experience is exhilarating, if I could call it that. I mean, my first dive was with um, sharks off the east coast of South Africa. Uh, one of those dives where you don't have a cage and it's just um, sharks feeding around you. Today we have something that's maybe on a similar level. It's just dolphins that um, obviously interact with you in their world. It's a diving place called the Dolphin. It looks a bit tropical for what I would have thought would be the Red Sea. Good morning. Good. 
Nadim. Nice to meet you. Hello, I'm Rian. Hi. Okay, so we're going to be diving. And you haven't dived before? No. You are so perfect for this. <laughs> I'm so excited. Let's go. <laughs> so I'm Claudine Gindi. I'm 22 from Elat. I've been in the Army for two years. I gained a lot from our um, military service. I experienced something that I never experienced before. I loved it. It was amazing. What is the first thing you think about when you think about diving? But I'm just thinking of how beautiful it can be. Yo, you have now, if you start with that attitude, you're definitely going to make it a lot more fun. Yeah. Hello, hello. Hello, Hi. how are you doing? How are you doing? So we, no, we are so excited. <laughs> Yeah. Um, we want to see the dolphins. Okay, so what do you see right here? This is the dolphin reef. This is the Red Sea. You got here all the closed area between the dolphins and the, the swimmers themselves. Okay. Uh, we don't want to put them together. Right here we can come to do a briefing and let's go diving. So adventure means to me, first of all, having fun and enjoying every moment. Meeting new people, learning about myself, about making good experiences that I will remember for all my life. Okay, so when we're gonna go, go diving, the only important thing right here is this device right here, it's called a regulator. Okay, this is my air source, it doesn't leave the mouth the whole dive time. Grab it here with the teeth and with the lips, cover up everything. This is what keeps you alive. Uh-huh, you should keep it in your mouth. <laughs> <laughs> hmm? Slowly, calmly, sounds like Darth Vader, okay? <laughs> and we got the mask here. First of all, if I got water in my mask, I don't need to go up, I can clear them under the water. How do you do this? Two fingers right here on the top frame. You look up and you blow off your nose. All the air that comes out of my nose wanna go up and block the upper way, so it's just gonna push the water down. Okay, another okay. thing now about the mask is you got a rubbery nose. Mm -hmm. Okay, why is that? As I'm gonna go deeper and deeper, I'm gonna feel pressure in my ears. To release that pressure, I have to equalize. Okay, just close your nose and breathe out through the nose while it's sealed. You're gonna feel the pop in your ear. Okay, we can't talk on the water, so we're gonna use hand signals. We got everything is okay. It's a question and an answer. We got the problem sign, and then you point to where the problem is. Problem <laughs> that we can't solve on the water, we're gonna go up to solve it, and after we solve the problem, we can go back down again. I've never scuba dived before. I just love the sea. I always love the ocean. The ocean is something I was born with because it's always here. I'm just happy to have this experience to see the, the dolphins. I never seen them so close before. Finally. <laughs> are we okay? You look terrific. Thanks ready for that. diving? Yeah. We are ready. Scuba diving is yet another man-made invention that allowed us to venture to new places a human being is not naturally supposed to go. Once we had our gear checked, set and ready, we headed off to the nearby beach to get Claudine comfortable with the scuba process. So Elon, we're gonna get into the water yeah. and then just do the retraining again. Yeah, first of all, okay. just calm breathing right no. here, only with the face in the water. Then after see that everything is okay, we can get in. Okay, I'm excited, <laughs> how are you feeling? I am excited too. <laughs> Shame, she's I'm a little bit excited. nervous. <laughs> yeah, I can see that. You know what, the thing is there's apprehension because the idea of being underwater, I think, it is not natural for it's us to even consider humans. it. So that's, I think, where the nerves come from. First time scuba divers have got to make a complete readjustment to how their body functions when learning how to scuba. Claudine was a little panicky to start, but with Elon and I guiding her through the process, she was slowly getting the hang of it. Elon, are we ready for the dolphins now? Yeah. Yeah, you are. We're gonna introduce you to a girl named Tal. Yeah? In case she knows everything you need to know about dolphins, she's gonna tell you everything. Sure, this is gonna be brilliant. The reef is home to a colorful array of tropical fish, and most significantly, a school of bottlenose dolphins. It was established over 20 years ago with the vision of bringing humans closer to animals in a sensitive and respectful way. The dolphins are not kept captive. They live in their natural habitat and have free access to the open sea. We are very, very excited to meet your dolphins. I'm here at the Dolphin Reef. We have four dolphins, a male and three females, and they sure. were all born here. But what you need to remember when you uh, go diving is that you are visitors in their home. Yes. And this is the basic assumption that uh, uh, helps us uh, create this place and have daily experiences with the dolphins, that sure. we are the guests in their home. They run the show here, not us and the show basically is their natural life. There's no script? No script. Good. Every day is a new surprise. 
So Alon showed us a little bit of how to get underwater. I think it's about time we got underwater with dolphins. Let's do it. <laughs> Have a good time. We headed back off to meet our guides who had spent years building relationships with the dolphins. Hi guys. Hi. I'm Rion. No, nice to meet you. Hey. I'm hey, Jan, nice Hi. to meet you. They were going to escort us on this adventure and give us the best chance possible of interacting with these amazing creatures. I can't believe we spent this whole day just <laughs> trying and trying, and now we're actually gonna get in the water. Hey. As soon as we had stepped foot in the warm Red Sea, a dolphin had already arrived to greet its old friends. And all the stories about the natural sociability of these animals was immediately being justified. The reef was a completely different world we were diving into, with crystal clear water revealing coral and fish life in all its multicolored wonder. Claudine was handling herself expertly and getting an adventure under the water that she never dreamed of. A lot can be said for the planet's second smartest animals, and these dolphins owned the waters that they lived in. They, like us, seemed to be there just for the experience of the adventure, curious about who we were and swimming around us for the sheer fun of it all. They're fast too, reaching speeds of up to 30 kilometers an hour under the water and swimming past you in the blink of an eye. The chance to see these graceful animals in their own home was as eye-opening as it was special. They have no real predators, save for human beings. And because of that, you feel that there is no natural fear instinct to them. They're just too smart for that. The Middle East region of the world will always be known for its sweeping deserts and endless horizons. But for my guests and I, the adventures took us to the spectacular waters in Israel. It's a place that has so much to offer and experiences that you will not find anywhere else. The Red Sea is alive, eh? Claudine, how is that? Amazing. Look Hello. behind you. Oh, Nana. That's Nana. Nana. It's a hello to Nana. Nana. Hi, Nana. Nana. <laughs> hello, Nana. Claudine, what I took out of today for me, you know, as a diver, you don't get surprised all the time. And for me, the Red Sea blew me away. For you? I had so much fun. Like, it was, fun? I just overcame my fear in like 10 minutes. It was unbelievable. I love the oceans. I've spent so much of my life exploring them. And even for a veteran like me, the adventures that Israel provided were life changing. I've dedicated my life to pursuing the impossible. And what I've learned through the adventures that I've gone on is that the impossible is often just a mindset. There is an ocean between saying and doing. And for most people, that ocean never gets smaller. I'm the first person to have circumnavigated the entire African continent by bicycle, a journey that took two years, two months, and 15 days. I've kayaked around Madagascar and Iceland. I've rowed across the Atlantic and Pacific Oceans. These were my adventures. Now, I want to share my knowledge with the world. Every week, I'll be inviting a new guest to join me so that I can prove that adventure is everywhere and is waiting for you. I'm Rian Mansa, and welcome to How to Adventure.
Adventuring is an amazing gateway into new, exciting places, and my journey through Israel had shown me parts of the country that I hadn't even considered as adventure destinations. My last day was going to be spent in the ancient city of Jerusalem, and I wanted to approach it in a new and exciting way. I wanted to take this adventure to the streets of Jerusalem and explore as much as the city had to offer as quickly as I could. Israel for me has been all about the outdoors. So for me to take this last day and in the city of Jerusalem, just one of the oldest biblical sites that one can find and to explore it on foot. We're not going with anybody. I've never been to this place. I have no idea what I'm going to uncover, but one thing I'm sure is that it is going to be an adventure. Now, the Mount of Olives is a good starting point, I think, for any visitor to Jerusalem. I think super historical, going back to the 1400s. And um, for me, I think, if I'm going to get inspiration of places I need to see in this amazing city, that is going to be the place. Jerusalem is considered one of the most holy sites on the planet. Today, I wanted to explore the city and those sites and try again a first-hand understanding of the significance and power that these ancient places held for people. This city is still busy waking up, but don't be fooled because it is Israel's busiest, busiest hub. My hotel was situated in the French Quarter, one of the many remnants of the European influence in the city. You'd be forgiven for waking up here and thinking that you were actually in a city in Europe. Local people are early risers here, preferring to catch the city's many buses, riding bicycles, and walking to work from their respective suburbs. The newer parts of the city were not what I wanted to be adventuring to, however, and I wanted to get an understanding of old, ancient Jerusalem. The best place to get a great view of the famous religious sites and understand the layout of the city was from the Mount of Olives. Up ahead is probably number one attraction in Jerusalem, the Mount of Olives. It's a place that gets thronged with tourists and I can see them up front already. It is the location of many biblical events and according to Jewish belief, the Messiah will descend the Mount of Olives on Judgment Day and enter Jerusalem through the Golden Gate. For this reason, Jews have always sought to be buried on the slopes of the Mount. The area serves as one of Jerusalem's main cemeteries, with an estimated 150,000 graves. I think when I get to look over these boundary walls, people say it's the oldest part of the city, and sites of King David and what he created lies ahead of me. Rising to more than 800 meters, it offers an unrivaled vista of the old city and its environment. Everybody is here for the same reason. I think I'll get a good sight of the place from here. The view from the mount really showcases the city and the religious sites that can be found within. It's quite a startling revelation to realize how close they're all to each other. There's the wall that they say King David had built or he had created when he first came to take over that fortress in Jerusalem. It astounds me that we're looking at something that's more than 3,000 years old. Wow! I don't think any person that has gone through a schooling and has been told about history actually understands that you can get to Jerusalem and physically see it and touch it. It's not really my style to just look at a city from the outside. My style is to actually get stuck in. Now Jaffa Gate I'm going to aim for. It's a famous gate where Pilgrims and travelers used to come into Jerusalem. Very old place. I think the route down below us is what gets us to that. These stairs will get me to it. 
I had a scope and an idea of how this ancient part of the city functioned, and now I was absolutely excited by the prospect of exploring it firsthand. So 3,000 years ago, there was nothing here. And now when you move around in Jerusalem, it's almost as if everything is on top of each other. If you're driving a car in this city, you need to have good brakes because your car is not gonna stop itself on these steep hills. It's almost straight down here like in a mine shaft. Wow, there definitely is action in this city. Unbelievable. This is probably 10,000 graves just in this one area alone. Entering into the old city as it's known is done through a series of gates that were constructed by Suleiman the Magnificent in the 16th century. It's actually a bit of a walk to get here. Seven gates were constructed in the walls of the old city, the most famous of which is the Jaffa Gate. Wow, the Jaffa Gate. There is something remarkable and special about heading through these ancient structures into the old city. You leave modern day Jerusalem behind you and enter into a time portal, transporting you back to the past. Jaffa Gate, this is the actual gate that's at the end of the road that comes from Jaffa town. So the pilgrims came into this place 2,000 years ago, leading into this gate into the old city. You get through Jaffa gate, and the first thing that shocks me is just the old city and the new world. It's not as if you're getting into a place that's not going to have ATMs and cappuccinos. It's a real mix of the old world with the new world. The gate leads into an ancient courtyard where you can take various paths to the Muslim, Christian or Jewish quarters. My first stop though was straight in front of me and into the old market. Look at that. Sure, I've got a nostalgic feel when I think of some of the markets, the birds, the people. With a distinctive Arabian Nights feel to it, the Arab market, or souk, located in the Christian and Muslim quarters of the old city, is a labyrinth of alleyways lined with shops. In the market, it feels as if you've taken a step back in time, and anyone who's ever seen a James Bond or Indiana Jones film will feel like they're now in the world of a movie. Yeah, the market is getting busier and busier, but the actual old town is above you now, where before it wasn't. So we're in the market in probably one of the most historical places in the world, and if um, anybody else thinks that they know bargaining and haggling, um, this is the home of it, and this is where it all started. You can just hear people negotiating about everything. I think I'm gonna get into that a little bit later myself. Everything here is up for negotiation, and haggling is seen as part of the business of selling. You would probably get laughed at by the locals for agreeing to the first price on offer, so you need to have your negotiating skills ready. It's so easy to get lost in these little alleyways, and with my enthusiasm, that's gonna happen a lot today. So, among all the activity and the chaos, I'm still trying to find probably my number one site and signs for it, the temple with Jesus and the site of Golgotha, which is down here. That is going to be my number one place to visit. So probably, the number one site I think that Christians around the world um, visit is the site of Golgotha and the tomb of Jesus. So for me to actually be heading to this place is um, actually blowing my mind. I'm gonna see it firsthand. As a child, you know, I've grown up hearing about these stories and the Bible talks about it and it actually is real. 
After making my way past other churches and restaurants, I came across a small archway leading to one of the most holy sites in Christianity, the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. The site is incredibly important to those of the Christian faith and draws thousands of people to the massive church every year. This is um, definitely the most sensitive um, site for Christianity and I don't think it's appropriate for us to take the big cameras in. So my crew is gonna try to get one small camera in. I'm gonna carry the GoPro and we're going to um, at least just experience what this place is about without intruding too much. I'm just carrying my little camera with me to see if I can get some footage of what uh, this holy site is about. The church rests on Golgotha, the place where Christ was crucified and buried. Just inside the entrance to the church is a stone of the anointing, which tradition believes to be the spot where Jesus' body was prepared for burial. On the wall behind the stone of anointing, a Greek mosaic depicts Christ being taken down from the cross. The rotunda is located in the center of the Anastasis, beneath the larger of the church's two domes. The dome is decorated with a 12-pointed star, the rays symbolizing the outreach of the 12 apostles. In the center of the rotunda is the chapel called the Edicule, which contains the Holy Sepulcher itself. Definitely not able to get to the actual tomb itself. Um, the queues are just too long and I didn't have that time. It was a one day um, adventure getting through to as many sites as I could imagine. And I think um, this queue's not gonna allow me. You can't help but feel an overwhelming sense of reverence when walking through this holy site. And even those not of the Christian faith can learn from and appreciate the history and belief that this building radiates. Definitely um, a bit of a scrum and a bit of uh, getting used to, but I think, um, sure, very, very special um, time for me to be able to be in there. And I'm so glad that with all the craziness and the rushing of this last day in Israel, I was able to actually see it. You're trying to fit in uh, a lot into a little bit of the day. The Wailing Wall is next. The Western Wall, known as the Wailing Wall to most people, is a place I've only seen on TV. From one faith's religious site to another, and a quick walk to the Jewish quarter brought me to the Wailing Wall. Today, the exposed portion of the Wailing Wall faces a large plaza in the Jewish quarter, which has been a venue for pilgrimage and prayer for Jews since the 16th century. Obviously, I have zero idea of what really takes place here, except that people pray, except that this is special for Jewish, Christian, and Muslim people. When you look at these people, you look at one person, and you can see that those people are devoted, and they have a reason for being here. Shame, some of the people right against the wall. Shame, some people actually look emotional. So the wall is mainly for Jewish people. It actually is entirely for Jewish people. But I'm going to put a yarmulke on. I'm going to go to the wall and I'm going to get a first-hand idea of what it is like to actually be at the wall. According to ancient beliefs, the presence of God dwells here. And hence, the place is also known as the ear of God. I think the idea is to write a prayer. I think the idea is to leave it over here and symbolically, you know, send that prayer to God. And this wall, when you get close to it, you just realize the effort that people have made. There are small, tiny little cracks here with little messages in that I'm sure are so important to the people who've put them here.
Even though it stands on disputed land, the Wailing Wall is more than a historic asset. It signifies the Jewish roots and is a central religious point of focus for Jews, both local and international. The city of David can be found just outside of the Wailing Wall Plaza, and a quick walk out of the city's gates takes you towards the Arab quarter of the city of David. But I wasn't too interested in what was above the ground. Deep below the surface of the city is a dark, winding waterway that provided people in the area with life-giving water. It was also used by the militaries of old to capture the city from below. Yo, the tunnels are narrow, but the city of Jerusalem has given us exclusive access to these underwater tunnels that are 3,000 plus years old. So this was the fresh water that supplied everybody in the area with enough water to be able to survive. It is cold, but I guess that says something, not many germs. The tunnels are super narrow. You can actually see where they have been carved out to be able to create this water flow. So if you imagine, this water started from somewhere within a well and is now busy running downhill. So we're essentially heading just deeper and deeper into the earth underneath Jerusalem. The tunnel system known as Hezekiah's Tunnel was carved through the mountainside in order to bring water from one side of the city to the other. The tunnel is over half a kilometer long and is considered one of the greatest works of water engineering for its time, having been constructed 2,700 years ago in 701 BC. I'm gonna have to concentrate now because I'm battling with my shoulders to even get through here. You are going to be as claustrophobic as any time in your life. This is not easy to be in if you're nervous about shortage of space. You can almost feel the air get thicker. It's a constant drop in, in altitude as water is flowing strongly in one direction. So we're losing oxygen every single meter we keep moving forward. If something had to go wrong in here, we really would be in trouble. Suddenly the ceilings have got two to three times their height. And I don't know what the reason is. Possibly if they were flooding and they needed more volumes of water to flow through. So I can see the light. You can actually taste the fresh air. Yes. Oh, and see stairs. It's a little bit of a relief, eh? No. It was incredible to me that something as ancient as this had been preserved for so long and defiantly stood the test of time. Now, I've been one of those people that have said the tourist trap towns are not for adventure. And today, Jerusalem has just shown me how it absolutely can be. From the crack of dawn for me to head to the Mount of Olives, from there to lead to the historic Jaffa Gate and to be led into this old, old city that I've only heard stories in the Bible about. I think for me, the emotional part of the day was definitely Jesus' tomb. I think to learn a little bit about the Wailing Wall and where the Jews pray was an eye opener. And then I have to say, come on, I got a chance to go where other people have not, underneath the city of Jerusalem. That's an adventure that I think not many people have. <laughs>